Hi everyone, welcome to this next episode of Your Daily Equation. And today, I think it's going to be a quick episode. Sometimes I think it's going to be quick and then, you know, I keep on going forever. But this one, all I want to do is say a few remarks about Schrodinger's equation. And then after those insights, which I hope that you'll find interesting, I'll then move on to the generalized version of Schrodinger's equation because so far in this series, all I did was the Schrodinger equation for a single particle moving in one spatial dimension. So I just want to generalize that to the situation of many particles moving, say, through three spatial dimensions, you know, a more ordinary, realistic situation. Okay, so first for the few brief remarks on Schrodinger's equation itself, let me write that equation out so that we all recall where we are. Good. All right. So remember what Schrodinger's equation was. It said I h bar d psi say of x and t dt equals minus h bar squared over 2m d2 psi of x t dx squared. And there are a number of things I could say about this equation, but let me just first note the following. It is perhaps a little bit strange that there is an I in this equation, right? You're familiar from your studies in high school that I as the square root of negative one is a useful idea, a useful concept to introduce mathematically, but you know, there's no device that measures how much in an imaginary sense a quantity may be, like devices measure real numbers. So at first blush, you might be a little bit surprised to see a number like I cropping into a physical equation. Now, first off, bear in mind that when it comes to interpreting what psi is telling us physically, remember what we do, we talk about probability of x and t, and we immediately look at the norm squared, which gets rid of any imaginary quantities, because this guy over here, this is a, a real number, and it's also a non-negative real number, and if properly normalized, it can play the role of a probability, and that's what Born, Max Born told us, that we should think about this as a probability of finding the particle at, say, a given position at a given moment in time. But I'd like you to recall in our derivation of Schrodinger's equation where the I actually came in in a, in a more mechanical sense, and you'll recall it came in because I took this ansatz, this starting point for what a probability wave might look like, as e to the i kx minus omega t. And, you know, there's your i right there. Now, remember, this is cosine of kx minus omega t plus i sine of kx minus omega t. And when I introduced this particular form, I said, hey, this is merely a convenient device for being able to talk about cosine and sine simultaneously, not sort of having to go through a calculation multiple times for each of those possible wave shapes. But I actually slipped in something more than that in the derivation because you recall that when I looked at, say, d psi dt, right? And of course, we look at this expression over here, and we can just get that to be minus i omega e to the i kx minus omega t, namely minus i omega psi of x and t. The fact that the result, after taking a single derivative, is proportional to psi itself, that would not have turned out to be the case if we were dealing with cosines and sines separately because the derivative of cosine 
gives you something sine, divisor sine gives you cosine. They flip around. And it's only in this combination that the result of a single derivative is actually proportional to that combination. And the proportionality is with a factor of i. And so that's the vital part in the derivation where we have to look at this combination cosine plus i sine because if this fellow is not proportional to psi itself then our derivation it's a too strong a word our our motivation for the form of the Schrodinger equation would have fallen through we wouldn't have been able to then equate this to something involving d2 psi dx squared again which is proportional to psi itself if these weren't both proportional to psi we wouldn't have an equation to speak of and the only way that that worked out was by looking at this particular combination of cosines and sines. What a messy page, but I hope you get the basic idea. So fundamentally from the get-go, Schrodinger's equation has to involve imaginary numbers. Again, this particular probability interpretation means that we don't have to think about those imaginary numbers as something we literally go out and measure, but they are a vital part of the way that the wave unfolds through time. Okay, that was point number one. What is point number two? Point number two is that this equation, this Schrodinger's equation, is a linear equation in the sense that you don't have any psi squared or psi cubes in there. And that's very nice because if I was to take one solution to that equation called psi one and multiply it by some number and take another solution called psi two, whoops, I did not mean to do that, and come on, stop doing that, psi two, then this would also solve the Schrodinger equation. This combination, because this is a linear equation, I can look at any linear combination of solutions and it too will be a solution. That's very, very vital. That's like a key part of quantum mechanics. It goes by the name of superposition, that you can take distinct solutions of the equation, add them together, and still have a solution that needs to be physically interpreted. We'll come back to the, the curious features of physics that that yields, but the reason I'm bringing it up here is you'll note that I began with one very particular form for the wave function involving cosines and sines in this combination, but the fact that I can add multiple versions of that ansatz, say, with different values of k and omega standing in the right relationship so that they solve the Schrodinger equation means that I can have a wave function psi of x and t, which is equal to a sum, or in general, an integral, of the solutions that we studied before, sum of solutions of the canonical sort that we began with. So we're not limited, is my point, to having solutions that literally look like that. We can take linear combinations of them and get wave shapes of a whole variety of much more interested, much more varied wave shapes. Okay, good. Those are the, I think those are the two main points that I wanted to quickly go over. Now for the generalization of the Schrodinger equation to multiple spatial dimensions and multiple particles. And that's, that's really quite straightforward. So we have IH bar d psi dt equals minus h bar squared over 2m psi of x and t. And, you know, I was doing it for the free particle case, but now I'm going to put in the potential that we also discussed in our derivation. So that's for one particle in one dimension. What would it be for one particle, say, in three dimensions? Well, you don't have to think hard to guess what the generalization would be. So it's i h bar d psi. Now, instead of having x alone, we have x1, x2, x3, and t. I won't write down the argument every time, but I will on occasion when it's useful. What will this be equal to? Well, now we'll have minus, oh, I left out the d2 dx squared here. We'll have minus h bar squared over 2m dx1 squared psi plus d2 psi dx2 squared 
plus d2 psi dx3 squared. We just put all of the derivatives, all the second order derivatives with respect to each of the spatial coordinates and then plus v of x1, x2, x3 times psi, and I won't bother writing down the argument. So you see that the only change is to go from d2 dx squared that we had in the one-dimensional version to now including the derivatives in all of the three spatial directions. Good. Not, not too complicated on that. But now let's go to the case where, say, we have two particles. Not one particle, two particles. Well, now we need coordinates for each of the particles, spatial coordinates. So like the time coordinate will be the same for them. There's only one dimension of time. But each of these particles has their own location in space that we need to be able to ascribe probabilities for the particles being at those locations. So let's do that. So let's say that for particle one, we use, say, x1, x2, and x3. For particle two, let's say we use x4, x5, and x6. Now, what will the equation be? Well, it gets a little bit messy to write down, but you can guess it. I'll try to write small. So ih bar d psi, and now I have to put x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, and x6, and t. This guy, derivative with respect to t, what is that equal to? Well, let's say particle number one has mass m1 and particle number two has mass m2. Then what we do is minus h bar squared over 2m1 for the first particle. Now we look at d2 psi dx1 squared plus d2 psi dx2 squared plus d2 psi dx3 squared. That's for the first particle. For the second particle, we now have to just add in minus h bar squared over 2m2 times d2 psi dx4 squared plus d2 psi dx5 squared plus d2 psi dx6 squared. Okay, and in principle, there is some potential that will depend on where the particles both are located. It can depend mutually on their positions. So that means I'd add in v of x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, x6 times psi. And that's the equation that we are led to. And there's an important point here, which is that especially because this potential can depend generally on all six of the coordinates, three coordinates for the first particle and three for the second, it's not the case that we can write psi for this whole shebang, x1 through x6 and t. It's not that we can necessarily split this up, say, into phi of x1, x2, and x3 times, say, chi of x4, x5, x6. Sometimes we can pull things apart like that. But in general, especially if you have a general function for the potential, you can't. So this guy over here, this wave function, the probability wave, it actually depends on all of the six coordinates. And how do you interpret it? So if you want the probability that, say, particle one is located at position x1, x2, x3, I put a little semicolon to pull it apart, and that particle 2 is at location x4, x5, x6 for some specific numerical values of those six numbers of the six coordinates, you'd simply take the wave function, and this is at, say, some particular time, you take the wave function at those positions, I won't bother, bother writing it down again, and you would square that guy. And if I was being careful, I wouldn't say directly at those locations. There should be an interval around those locations, blah, blah, blah. But I'm not going to worry about those sort of details here because my main point is that this guy over here depends upon, in this case, six spatial coordinates. Now, oftentimes,
people think about a probability wave as living in our three-dimensional world. And the size of the wave at a given location in our three-dimensional world determines the quantum mechanical probabilities. But that picture is only true for a single particle living in three dimensions. Here we have two particles, and this guy doesn't live in three dimensions of space. This guy lives in six dimensions of space, and that's just for two particles. Imagine that I had n particles in, say, three dimensions. Then the wave function that I would write down would depend on x1, x2, x3 for the first particle, x4, x5, x6 for the second particle, and on down the line until if we had n particles, we would have three n coordinates as the last fella down the line. And we can include the t as well. So this is a wave function over here that lives in three n spatial dimensions. So let's say n is 100 or something, 100 particles. This is a wave function that lives in 300 dimensions. Or if you're talking about the number of particles, say, making up a, a human brain, whatever that is, 10 to the 26 particles, right? This would be a wave function that lives in 3 times 10 to the 26 dimensions. So your mental image of where the wave function lives can be radically misleading if you only think about the case of a single particle in three dimensions where you can literally think about that wave if you want as sort of filling our three-dimensional environment. You can't see it, you can't touch that wave, but you can at least imagine it living in our realm. Now, big question is, is the wave function real? Is it something out there physically? Is it simply a mathematical device? These are deep questions that people argue about, but at least in the single particle three-dimensional case, you can picture it if you want as living in our three-dimensional spatial expanse. But for any other situation with multiple particles, if you want to ascribe a reality to that wave, you have to ascribe a reality to a very high dimensional space because that's the space that can contain that particular probability wave by virtue of the nature of the Schrodinger equation and how these wave functions look. So that's really the point that I wanted to make. Again, it took me a little bit longer than I wanted to. I thought this would be a real quickie, but it's been a, a medium duration one. I hope you don't mind. But that's the lesson. The equation that summarizes the generalization of the single particle Schrodinger equation necessarily yields probability waves, wave functions that live in high dimensional spaces. And so if you really want to think about these probability waves as being real, you're led to think about the reality of these higher dimensional spaces, huge number of dimensions. I'm not talking about string theory here with like 10, 11, 26 dimensions. I'm talking about enormous numbers of dimensions. Do people really think that way? Some do. Some, however, think that the wave function is merely a description of the world as opposed to something that lives in the world. And that distinction allows one to sidestep the question of whether these high dimensional spaces are actually out there. Anyway, so that's what I wanted to talk about today. And that is your daily equation. Looking forward to seeing you next time. Until then, take care.